If you're a business owner or a CEO, release the brakes of judgment for a moment and listen up. You're bound to learn something new, starting right now. Hello, thanks for joining me today. My guest this week is a board-certified family medicine physician. He served on active duty in the U.S. Navy. Following his naval service, he graduated from the University of Louisiana in Lafayette. Then he graduated from one of the nation's oldest osteopathic medical schools, the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. He completed family medicine residency training at Fort Benning, Georgia, while on active duty in the United States Army. He served on active duty as a physician until moving back to Lafayette in 2014. He opened up his direct primary care practice, Elite DPC in Lafayette. Welcome to the show, Dr. Creighton Shute. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks for your service. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for your taxes. <laughs> so you went from high school to the U.S. Navy that's right. Uh, you, you saw Top Gun, you saw the bike, the girl, and said, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, I am exactly in that age range. Top Gun was definitely the movie that pushed me over the top. Uh, my father served in the Navy during Vietnam, and so there was that uh, example as well. Um, and But then, you know, watching Top Gun in the 80s, whenever that movie came out, certainly was, um, you know, it was a very sexy movie. And, and at 18, oh, yeah. you want to go do those kind of things. And so... I joined the Navy right out of high school. Yeah, I remember those young and dumb days myself. Yeah. <laughs> Though I'd never served. So um, my dad did say, he was U.S. Army. He did say, son, if you go into the service, go into the Navy, the food's better. And, <laughs> it's true. Okay. So you, you also, you went from the Navy back to the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. That's right. And then you went to medical school and then you went into the U.S. Army and now you're at Elite DPC. So can you sort of unpack this circuitous route <laughs> that you well, took? Well, it's a really long story. I know that your, your viewers don't want to have a two hour story in my life. But um, the quick story is when I uh, so I, I loved my time in the Navy. I loved my time in the military. I was, you know, enjoyed serving and um, I wanted to go back and give back a lot of the things that were given to me um, from officers when I was enlisted. And so uh, I was really excited about going back into the military. I actually had a Navy scholarship all lined up and, and you know, was had gone through MEPS and everything was going, was going to go back into the Navy as a physician. And my fiance at the time, who is now my wife, uh, didn't like the idea of going back into the military and, and didn't like the idea of, of what she thought was giving up control of our lives. Mm. And so I thought, well, you know, everyone else is paying for school with medical, with, with loans. And so I guess I'll do the same thing. And, and then, um, uh, when I was a third year medical student, we had our first child while in medical school and, and anyone who's done that knows how difficult it is. Wow. Um, but our finances fell apart because my wife was the primary breadwinner while I was in medical school. And, uh, and so she said, Hey, tell me about that, that Navy thing again. <laughs> and so, uh, I went back and I asked the Navy about scholarships at that point, and And I was almost done with my third year in school. And they said, well, we'll pay for your, your last six months of your fourth year medical school. And we have a minimum three year payback. And I thought, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> and so I said, I'll call you back. And so I called the air force and I got pretty much the same answer. And I called the army and they said, Hey, we would love to have you. This was during the heat of the, of oh, yeah. the uh, Iraq war. And so, um, they said, we'll pay you a, a big bonus and, and, um, and we'll backdate your pay to today. You know, we'll get all the contracts signed, everything, everything, and, and we'll pay for all of your fourth year. And so ultimately the decision was initially just because it was a better financial choice at the time. But, um, but I've learned since then that the army is so much bigger than the air force or Navy that uh, it was really good for me professionally, gave me a lot of options. And, and, um, and so I'm eternally grateful for that option that, 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 you know, sure. whatever that, the, the road was that brought me to the army. And, and the cool thing is that I got to experience both and can speak to both experiences. 
Don't yeah. ask me who I cheer for during the Army Navy game. Everyone asks me that. I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> We're bouncing back and forth. Yeah, I won't ask. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you wound up, you you wound up back in Lafayette after the Army. Yeah. And then you started Elite DPC, but there's a there's a a gap I think in there because D- Elite is recent. Yes, uh, about what? a year and a half. What drove the decision from what drove the what motivated you to to say i I'm going to open up elite? Well, um, you know, I had been introduced to the idea of membership style medicine or or what had previously been called concierge medicine. Uh, when I was in medical school, I was lucky enough to rotate with a physician who had a private practice where he had you know part part of his practice was insurance based and part of his practice was um, was really concierge medicine. He was charging patients like $500 a month for cell phone access and direct access to him at the time. But I was really impressed with the community that that established with that group of patients and even amongst the patients um, who all kind of knew each other and knew that they were all patients of that one doctor. Um, and, you know, ultimately just started thinking about how I could make that possible for anyone, how to make it affordable for anyone. You start running through the numbers and, um, and had the idea, even right after I got out of the Army, and I was doing some ER work to pay the bills at the time, and, um, and really considered opening a practice. And, and um, uh, you know, man, again, that would be such a long story, but, but kind of dipped my toe in the idea at the time and then sort of got cold feet uh, because it's such a big jump, you know, to say that I, we've been doing medicine a, a certain way for the last, you know, I don't know, 70 years or something or, you know, whatever. And, um, uh, and so I'm going to, you know, just jump off the deep end and do something totally different, um, was a big step. And so, you know, with children and being married and everything, it's difficult to make that decision. So, so I took an employed position for a couple of years and, and, you know, again, another thing that I'm really grateful for in my life and really got a a really, um, (laughs) intense look at what, what it's like to do, uh, everything through insurance companies and, and Medicare and Medicaid and, and, um, you know, just over time became more and more disillusioned with it and, and ultimately thought, you know, I can do this. There were a lot of DPC doctors around the country that were starting to do the same thing. They'd all kind of done the same math and come up with the same numbers. And I thought, you know, my idea that I've been having in my head now for the past 10 or 15 years is it's feasible because there are doctors around the country that are doing this. And, um, you know, there were some books that were written about direct primary care and there's some guys that, you know, had made it onto the news and had got, you know, had kind of gotten some national presence and and um and and every time something like that happened a friend of mine that knew that I was interested in that concept would forward me those articles or somebody sent me a book and and I read it and and I just I couldn't get the bug you know out of my head and so um so in May of uh 2018 I decided to close my practice I worked directly with the hospital system there so that it wasn't an adversarial relationship um, and they were supportive of it. They let me out of my non-compete and, and said, you know, we give you, we give you uh, our blessing. And, and, um, and that's one of the things that I really encourage a lot of other DPC doctors to do is to try to, as best they can, work with their hospital systems to let them know that they don't intend to be a threat to the system. They just want to show people a different way. Um, and, you know, I was lucky enough to have a hospital system that was supportive. And, and so um, we opened the practice. You know, I left the practice in May of 18 with plans to open in July. And uh, anyone who's ever been through the build out of a clinic knows that construction workers say two months, they mean that they really mean like eight. (laughs) And so uh, I got the keys to the, to the clinic here um, in December of 18 and opened formally in January of 18. Well, congratulations on that one. It's a, it's a frustrating time for a lot of physicians. So they're, a lot of them are looking for inspiration and it's doctors like you that are providing it, saying, you know, showing a path forward. So I can, I think they're looking up to you. So, well, just you, uh, anybody who's looking to me should know that I'm, I'm following someone else. You know, I'm not, I'm standing on somebody else's shoulders. And so sure. I'm, I'm always going to be grateful to those guys. Sure. So you had some expectations when you opened the doors. Did they change once <laughs> you were open? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when you think that you have a great idea, you're you're assuming that everyone else is going to assume that it's a great idea too. And uh, yeah, anyone 
anyone who's ever tried to start anything learns eventually that uh man it, it's it's just a little bit more difficult road than than um than you initially expect it to be um you know and for the lucky few there, there are some pragmatists in the world that start things knowing that it's going to be difficult and it ends up being easier for them at the end maybe than they thought it was because they were expecting something bad but um no to to a answer directly um we opened in january during that time where i was waiting on getting the keys to the clinic i had a pre-enrollment period for um for members who uh, basically i gave them care for free gave them all cell phone access for free for about six months um leading up to us actually opening in january and then i opened in january and uh, those 32 patients that i had pre-enrolled uh became about two patients who were actually paying and so i opened last january with two paying patients and uh and thought okay well i'm just going to start marketing and, and spending some money educating people and and i'm going to have people just you know lining up at the door and uh <laughs> that's not the way it happened it's been very very slow growth over the past year uh, experienced a little bit of, of um, backing up, I guess, right at the end of the year and, and early on in January. Uh, but now I've developed some more momentum and, and gaining new patients. And um, and so, you know, it's just a, just scratching a little bit at a time. And I'm not losing money on the practice anymore, which is a good thing. So I'm also mm -hmm. not taking a salary yet either. But. Well, it's, it is a process. There's no question about it, like anything. Yeah. And any entrepreneur any business owner, any, any CEO knows that processes are important and it's refining those over time and, and that's what you're doing. And obviously it's becoming more successful, which is terrific. I think you're probably running into the problem that I, I think is the biggest problem we have right now in the United States. And that is there's a huge education process that needs to be yeah. done about what great care is People know coverage, you know, they know their deductibles, they know their, they know their co-pays and they know networks. But when it comes to the attributes of great care, oof, brutal. And, and it's, it's not their fault. They've never had it. It's as simple as that. We've lost that over many decades. And what you're doing, of course, is bringing that back. But if you compare the two, the old system and the new system of direct primary care. What do, what do people need to know about the differences about what you offer at Elite DPC versus what they're used to? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, I mean, I can, I can describe that in so many different ways, but you know, I tell people all the time, I, I'm a father of six children, for those that don't know that about me, you know, and I'm, and I'm a husband to one. Um, and not that, oh my God, my wife is going to see this and say that I called her a child, but I'm a husband to one woman and a father to six children. How about that? So how about I, how about I do a little judicious editing? You want to start yeah, out right it. ahead? No, you can put it in there. It'll be a good laugh. But, um, <laughs> uh, and you know, I'm a physician, but at the end of the day, I'm also a daddy, I'm a husband and sometimes I'm a patient too. And just like everyone else, it's a very frustrating experience for me to walk into a doctor's office 15 minutes ahead of my appointment time, show up, walk up to the little frosted window that says, don't tap on the glass, ring the bell. So then you ring the bell and they open the window annoyed that you've done that uh, and ask you what you need, you know, and, and you say, well, I'm here for my appointment. And they hand you a stack of papers and it's the exact same stack of papers that you filled out the last time you were in that exact same office. And, um, and so then you spend 10 minutes filling out that stack of papers and you walk back up to the off to the window and you ring the bell more softly this time because you try not to annoy them like you did the first time and they open the window the exact same way and they say sit down and uh you know we'll, we'll call you in when it's your time and then somewhere between 20 minutes and 60 minutes later you finally get called back and you get a set they they give you a set of vitals and and then they put you in this cold room that you're you know sort of unfamiliar with and they say the doctor will be right with you and it's somewhere between 50 and, I mean, 15 and 50 minutes that you're sitting in this room. And it feels like forever, right? Because you're sitting in a room and you have no idea how long it's gonna be. And, and you can hear the, doc, the doctor talking right outside your door, right? Uh, because he's right next door, or, you know, walking out of the room next door and he's, you're thinking, oh, he's gonna come into my room next. And, and no, then you hear a door open and close across the hall. And he, so now you're waiting for a longer period of time. So then the doctor finally comes in and he's very kind and he shakes your hand and says, what can I do for you today? And, 
you have your one complaint that you're allowed to go through and he sits down and spends the next seven minutes with his back turned to you while he's typing on a computer. And then you get a prescription or you get an order for three more doctor's visits at other specialists, you know, uh, offices where you get to go experience that thing over and over and over again. And he says, come back and see me in six weeks. You know, everyone experiences that. It's not like it's an accident that I can describe that and people laugh about it or, or shake their heads about it or cry about it because everyone's experiencing healthcare in exactly the same way. And so the short way to say that is that you spend an hour of your time to get five minutes with your doctor. And the difference at Elite DPC, I don't need to explain it quite as extravagantly because we're so much more simple. You, you spend five minutes coming in here to spend an hour with your doctor. And we can go through a whole lot more than one complaint. And you don't spend a bunch of time sitting in rooms not knowing how long it's going to be. I mean, in fact, I, I meet my patients in my waiting room because I know when they're gonna be here. Everyone gets an hour scheduled with me. Um, and so when the door opens at 2 p.m., I know who that is and I meet them in the waiting room and, and shake their hands and smile at them and I bring them back myself and I do their vitals and I talk to them about their you know, pre-health questionnaire stuff and I put it in myself while I'm sitting facing them. Uh, and then we spend either just a few minutes or whatever time they need or we spend the next hour together talking about their health or we talk about you know, common interests or sometimes we talk about things that I'm not so interested in, but they're interested in it. And so I listen, you know, but that's the things that people get here in elite DPC. That's what people get in most direct primary care practices versus the other. And really the other is just driven. It's not that the doctor doesn't want to spend time with his patients or her patients. It's mm -hmm. that we spend so much time prior to the visit and after the visit, jumping through all the hoops that the insurance companies have placed in front of us to get reimbursed for our time that the patient suffers and experiences what I just described. That's, that's probably what surprises them the most. The fact they're sitting in front of you for an hour and they're going, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, got, we got an hour to fill here, guy. What, what, what do you want to talk yeah. about the ball game or <laughs> the first, the first thing that happens is a phone call. So I get a phone call from someone who's never called me before and, and they get, hello, this is Dr. Shoot. And I get this long pause on the other end and they're like, um, Wait, wait, you're the doctor? I say, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. I, I'm so sorry. Is there a secretary that I can call? I, did, I didn't mean to bug you. And I say, no, you're not bugging me. This is, <laughs> this is what you get here. It's okay. So that's the first weird thing. The second one is when I meet them in the waiting room and they have this like really wild, like wide-eyed look, like they, they came at the wrong time. And then the really, the third one that happens is when they're leaving and I walk them out through the waiting room and I can tell they have that little weird, like, I didn't get a bill. I'm not paying anything like this is something's wrong here and I you know I laugh and explain to them so everybody reacts the same way it's your monthly membership is all you're going to pay that don't even worry about it um, and so yeah and, and once the people have experienced it once they want to make sure that it's real and so they wait and experience it a second time and then once they've done that they realize that it, it really is what we say it is and they never want to leave yeah I, I have it here I won't go back I, I the access the I, I won't go back. That system, no thank you. And, and I live in a foreign country and even the doctors, some of the doctors here are saying, yes, this is the right model we need to go to. So there's a clue there. There's something else that I, I wanted to bring up and that is that I see a lot of DPC practices talking about how they save their patients money, the cost mm -hmm. savings. And I, I have in my notes, where is it? You saved a patient $450.66 a month for the same medications. That's yeah. $5,407 per year. Yeah. Per year on medications, same medications. What was the reaction like? I mean, that was probably like a mini lotto win. Uh, you know, and I'm probably shifting around in my chair when I shouldn't be because I, I start getting emotional when I think about that one story. Now, that, that's the most egregious example that I can think of. And, and that's why I think you probably pulled that from a, a Facebook post, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So uh, that's the reason we put it on Facebook, because she came in after a tearful conversation with a family friend who then said, you've got to talk to my friend and put me on the phone with her. And it was it was that phone call where she was like so weird that her friend put me on, put her on the phone with me directly. And, and, you know, she thought she was bothering me. And I said, look, why don't you just come into the office and let's go through your medications. And I literally sat down with her and logged into my broker's uh, ordering site and, and just showed her the prices on the medications and explained to her what she would pay monthly. 
And she paid uh, for six months of her medication, she paid less than what she was paying monthly previously. And what she was paying previously was less than what she should have been paying because she couldn't afford, uh, she couldn't afford some of her COPD medications. And we made some adjustments to those, to things that she could afford. Um, and so that cost savings doesn't even include the fact that we actually put her back on medications that she wasn't taking before because of the prices. Wow. I she mean, left the office in tears. Yeah. I, I've seen similar stories from other uh, DPC doctors about patients who are going to, who won Dr. Ann Riggs. It's one that I, I recall $7,000 for a month prescription and Dr. Riggs got it for $23. Yeah. <laughs> we can't always get them that cheap, but we, we get pretty close and it's pretty amazing. I mean, um, you know, we have patients here who are on, I have patients who, who have chosen to be members just because of the cost savings uh, for medications, even though they've got, you know, big blue cross blue shield plans um, that with their, with their, employer paid plan, their deductible on their blood pressure medication. Um, one person I'm thinking of from this week, in fact, um, he's got a, a, what he thought was like a big Cadillac plan through a, a large insurance provider paid for by his employer. And they've got prescription benefits and his co-payment for his uh, medications are four, to, I'm sorry, $6 each. Uh, and so he's paying $12 for two blood pressure medications. Uh, or yeah, he's paying $12 a month for two blood pressure medications and he comes here and gets them for 54 cents a month. And so he's getting complete access, can call me anytime and, you know, pays what he pays monthly for his membership. And right off the top, he's saving, um, you know, he's saving $11 and change, $11 and 50 cents roughly a month. Uh, just on his medications, just on his blood pressure medications. And that doesn't include the savings he gets on his lab work and, you know, not having to pay copays and deductibles uh, when he comes into the office. Yeah. I think there, there's an epidemic of ignorance about what great care is. I think given the time that we're taping with the coronavirus uh, going on, and it's not stupidity. It's, it's simply an unknown unknown, which is incredibly, it's got to be frustrating for you too, mm -hmm. because they walk in the door and they're so, they kind of like, well, yeah, I was told to come in and see you, but I don't know, doc, what is, what is this all about? And I yeah. think, I think there's a lesson here for local businesses. And, and by the way, how is DPC playing in Lafayette? Is it, is it getting any traction? Gaining a little bit of traction uh, recently, you know, after being open for uh, 13, almost 14 months now, um, we are gaining some traction. Word of mouth is spreading and people are having experiences. And, and then, you know, I'm getting phone calls from, from folks based on those experiences. Um, and so a lot of individuals coming in. But in fact, I have a small business with 13 employees uh, and they are in the middle of signing up this week, they're making changes with their insurance plan. And, and we're going to be saving that business, um, 13 employees. Uh, we're going to be saving them about 60% on what they're currently paying for uh, a fully insured health plan. 60% savings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The change in everyone over to, uh, um, basically just a catastrophic plan that the company is going to pay for hundred percent now. And so the employee will have no contribution to that. And then our membership, which is also going to be hundred percent covered by the, by the business now. And, uh, and we're saving them about 60% of what they were paying a month ago. Um, and the only thing the patients will have to pay for is medications and labs directly through our clinic, which are, you know, pennies on the dollar. That's, that's compelling stuff. I mean, it really Not is. to mention the access. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of oil field related businesses here in Lafayette. Mm -hmm. This is kind of, uh, the epicenter or used to be the epicenter of, of, um, oil production in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and so a lot of those people are, are now going off to, you know, all parts of the world um, during their time where they're, you know, working with these companies. And I, you actually, you can see it right there in the picture, but we have a map that we keep in the clinic and I put little push pins in it from little places, any place outside of Lafayette or outside a local area that someone has called us 
uh, and I've been able to talk with him. You mentioned coronavirus, and two days ago, we beat our record. Korea is about right there on the map, and we, we were able to talk to one of our patients who was in Korea working at a BP plant, uh, and they had a coronavirus scare. And so I talked with him for 20 minutes about, you know, what he should do to protect himself and, and kind of reassuring him a little bit. Yeah. I, I think I remember reading about um, Union County in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. The first year they implemented direct primary care, they saved $1.2 million. <laughs> if a government yeah. can do that, Hello, and government and, and a county government, state and local governments can't print money. This yeah. is this is hard dollars that they're saving. So it should be a lot easier for businesses to kind of get the memo, and and they are. Um, and I think it's knowing what I know, it's a no-brainer. So I'm glad to hear that it's gaining traction out, out in uh, Lafayette. But I think you can also make the case that you you can make more money. And if I put on my CEO hat, um, I understand that I have a lot on my plate as a CEO. And healthcare is a pretty complex subject. So I have to balance my time. And generally, a lot of CEOs and business owners will just farm it out. They say, call a benefits advisor and let me know how much the bottom line is, and, and we'll raise our costs accordingly, our, our prices yeah. accordingly to cover it. And so I think, I think if you're a CEO, you ought to take the brakes of judgment off and, and sit down and pay attention to what this brings to the table. But CEOs also have to, you know, they have a bottom line. I mean, they've got to pay attention to the bottom line. They've got other things in their plate. I got that. So it makes sense to sort of equate this to, um, things that they would understand. Uh, Every business has a process or multiple processes and they're deeply involved in those. And so one of the things that you mentioned is the faster access, even from Korea. Well, faster access equals less downtime for the employee. So productivity goes up, getting stuff done. And I'm wondering if you've got any examples of how that access um, for someone who calls you up in the morning and says, I, I got to go to work, but what, what do you have, what kind of examples do you have along that front? Sure. I mean, I, I could go through a number of those things, but I've had patients call me on Saturday morning who are working on Saturday. They can't afford to be away from the office uh, or away from their small businesses or whatever it is they do. Um, the one example I'm thinking of is actually, you know, a person who has a full-time job during the week and then they kind of have a side gig that they do on the weekends. And, um, they called me at like seven o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning and, you know, really upset about symptoms and, um, basically viral illness that was treated with, you know, some, some steroids and, and some antihistamines. But, um, but they met me here and I was able to examine them and reassure them that, you know, this is not, um, Ebola or anything. And, <laughs> And, uh, you know, and they get a steroid injection and, and a couple hours later that starts working and they start feeling a whole lot better and they get on their medications and, and are able to, you know, be productive through their day. And, and so in theory, um, that person made a whole lot more money than they, than they paid for the month of, of membership uh, just in that one day because of the access, you know, at seven o'clock in the morning rather than having to wait all weekend or go to an ER or an urgent care where they may have to sit for hours. Uh, Another example is, you know, a mom whose 15 year old son fell off of his bike and had a laceration on his arm seven o'clock in the evening. And rather than going to the ER and sitting in the ER for three or four hours, which would have kept her up all night and, you know, made her less productive in the day the next day, uh, they came and met me in the clinic. And I think they were probably out of here and home by before bedtime, I would say, you know, eight or eight thirty with, you know, maybe they were perfect sutures. I don't know. I'll, I'll go ahead and say they were. And, uh, and, you know, a bandaged up arm and, and, um, and again, no extra expense. It was really quick and, and they were super grateful for that. And mom gets a full night's sleep and, and has peace of mind and, and is, you know, her, her employer, uh, whether they know it or not, is, is happier because they have a more productive employee the next day um, because of that peace of mind and, and rapid access. You, you just mentioned something about you, you're preventing problems and, the employers and a lot of employers, if I'm a CEO, one of the things I do know 
is that the problem solvers, I know, I know who they are. It's far more difficult to find the people that prevent problems in any organization mm -hmm. for the simple reason the problems don't appear and they don't right. need to be solved. So what you're sort of being the unsung hero and businesses need to understand what that means. There's, there's another thing that uh, as, a, as a business owner, a CEO or you know, a manager, I want my people awake, aware, and alive at work. I want them focused and I want them, um, I want mental clarity. Uh, I want them to, to, to have good judgmental powers too. And I'm thinking of one cause that lowers those things and that's undiagnosed, untreated sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other things that you can think of medically that are in the same realm? They're undiagnosed, untreated, but time with the patient to unpack the patient's history, the tests they've had, et cetera, et cetera. And you can start to say, aha, now I know why you're feeling sleepy or et cetera. What are some of the other things? Yeah, I mean, again, long list of things, but just off the top of my head really quickly, uh, vitamin levels and, and those things, hormone levels, um, uh, hydration status, people's nutrition, um, pre-diabetes and diabetes that go undiagnosed for long periods of time, um, which then cause their own problems. I mean, I, the list goes on and on and on and on. Sure. Yeah, I was thinking, actually, I was thinking diabetes. Well, the, the more patient time you have and the more flexibility you have with your time, you can make sure that things like flu shots get done in a timely manner. Uh, and less sick days, that's a measurable thing. As a CEO, I can measure that. And I like things that can be measured. And most CEOs and business owners are like that. You're a business owner. You understand that. Yep. Um, you know, productivity goes up, but also what about my drivers? and accidents what about my customer service people are they kind of like you know when you went to your doctor's office and ring the bell and <laughs> what do you want <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't want that right and, and so there's some other things here that i'm thinking of i know my employees are stressed out and i know healthcare is a big part of that because it's the biggest issue in this year's election it's right up there at the top. I think over 65% of, of people say that healthcare is probably their number one worry and what they're focused on. And it seems to me that there's a lot of FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And since you served in the military, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so the care that you provide sort of reduces the FUD. They know they have access. They know they have time with you. They know they have someone who is capable of dealing things rapidly. And so you reduce that stress level. And from a management perspective, I'm all about that. I love that. And there are less suppressive influences for my employees, and that's a big one. And I want to lower that so they perform better and that they're able to make me more money. And one of the attributes of care that you sort of alluded to, and that is that, that people need a care quarterback, someone who's gonna coordinate all that. In your corner care is one of the ways I describe it. And so maybe a couple of examples of how you provided that care coordination for whether it's an individual or an employee. Well, you know, as you're talking about a care quarterback or care coordinator, that's one of the things that primary care doctors have been sort of pigeonholed as in the old system or the system that, you know, most people are, are dealing with now. And the reason for it is that, again, when you go through all of those hoops that are required to, uh, to get reimbursed for your time, uh, you have very little time to deal with a patient. And so, um, when someone comes in, you know, let's say I have someone who's in their mid fifties and they're overweight and they have high blood pressure and high cholesterol and, 
Um, and, you know, let's say they have asthma and they've had it as, since, it, since they were children and, um, and they've got diabetes or their, you know, metabolic syndrome and, or prediabetes. Um, and they come into my office in the old system. Um, I just didn't have time to go through all of those medications and all of the explanations about how those things are intertwined and, and can be improved by, you know, diet, exercise, weight loss, and all those things. And, um, and so it was just easier. And, you know, unfortunately, it was just the common thing. And it's, and it's probably the common thing for a lot of doctors now to say, you know, for your blood pressure issues, go and see a cardiologist and, and for your lipid issues as well. And for your uh, asthma issues, go see a pulmonologist. And for your diabetes, go see an endocrinologist. And, and oh, by the way, that sprained ankle that you have that's been hurting you for two weeks, go see an orthopedist or, a, uh, you know, or a, or a sports medicine doc. Um, and you go ahead and schedule those appointments and then come back and see me in six weeks and we'll talk about all those things. And so now that patient has spent two hours in my office, in my clinic at least, not in front of me, but they spent two hours in my clinic uh, so that I could send them off to four other doctors over the next six weeks so they could experience the same thing over and over and over again. Oh, by the way, paying copays or deductibles for those visits as well. Um, and, and experiencing the same thing all four times. And then they've got a fifth visit coming back to me to, in six weeks. Um, and with direct primary care, we, we just don't typically send patients to uh, specialists unless we need procedures done. Um, you know, if you need to have your gallbladder taken out, well, that's, that's a job for a general surgeon. We're not going to do that in the DPC right. office. But, uh, but I can treat diabetes, you know, um, with most, in most cases, I can treat diabetes just like any endocrinologist. I can treat asthma just like any pulmonologist. I can treat hypertension just like a cardiologist. I need the cardiologist on during those times when I need a stent placed in a patient. Um, and so when a patient has an hour with me, we go through all of those things in that hour and talk about the intertwining of those diagnoses and how, how they can be improved. And then, you know, we prescribe medications from here when necessary. Uh, for all of those medica for all of those problems, and and the coordination happens immediately right now. So I'm not going to be prescribing uh, a blood pressure medication that causes problems with the pulmonary med medication, which causes problems with with the diabetic medications, or or, or causes diabetic problems in general. Um, and so that coordination happens sort of by default in DPC um, because that's just what we do. We just coordinate everything, and so now the patient has one visit, it was one hour, it didn't cost them anything more than their monthly membership. And if they come back in six weeks, between now and six weeks from now, they're not going to have more doctor's visits, they're going to have a lot of product productivity at work, and they're going to have a lot of productivity in their families and, and in their own lives. Um, and hopefully improving if they're, you know, if they're doing the things that, that hopefully we're recommending correctly. Yeah, it's a lot more comprehensive than people think. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've come to know that that I, I don't need to go see a bunch of specialists. My doctor can handle it because he's got a family medicine background. He also happens to be a, uh, uh, an emergency medicine, uh, has a lot of emergency medicine background, including life flight. So, which is where I met him. Mm -hmm. And again, I have my CEO hat on. If I've got five salespeople and because of care, they're able to spend more time on the road or more time on the phone or more time in front of clients. Each one improves 2%, all things being equal. They increase their sales 2%. And that's 10% right there, increase in sales. Yeah. So it really is, there, there's money to be made on top of saving money, on top of preventing problems, and then solving some problems too, probably. Um, just in terms of, you know, keeping people motivated and keep, keeping people, keeping my people happy and, and loving what they do and looking forward to coming into work. So the other thing is that, that medicine has changed. Medicine has changed now more than ever. And I can imagine from your perspective, um, during the time you've been practicing medicine and, and in medical school. Um, when, did, when did you start practicing residency? Uh, I started, started practicing in 2010. 
So 10 years ago? 10 years ago. So an example would be genome at that point, to map a human genome was about $70,000, $75,000 to sequence a genome. Yeah. And it's $250 today. I'm probably if heading that. toward, yeah. yeah, if that. And, and that's just one of many tests that have come along in the meantime. So you have a lot more variability to deal with as a physician. And any, you don't even have to be a CEO, but if you're an assembly line worker, you know what happens. When you increase variability, that assembly line has to slow down to accommodate the variability or quality suffers. So... Slow medicine is really the recipe here, and that's exactly what you do. And I think those are, those are the kinds of things that a CEO or a business owner is probably going to go, wait a minute, that makes sense. There's a lot more to deal with. There's, there, it's, it's not just genome, it's di diet, environment, understanding stress, the research that comes in. So you're dealing with a lot more, and you need more thinking time too. Uh, am I wrong? <laughs> no, I mean, you're right. The complexities today require that we, we spend a lot more time researching and, and thinking about how we're treating our patients. And, you know, God bless the, the internet and the speed of access to information today. Cause I can't imagine, um, you know, uh, I can't imagine trying to sift through all of this just through books and things, but, um, you know, I, I'm sorry to, kind of double back on what you said a second ago, but it's interesting because I started thinking about the fact that um, not only is this slow medicine in that when I'm in the clinic, I can slow down and take time with my patients and before and after visits, I can take time thinking about, you know, what we talked about or what we're going to talk about. But, um, but there's also a lot of speed in what we do because that same sales force that you were talking about when they have problems on the road, they have direct access to me. They call me directly on the cell phone while they're on the road rather than thinking, man, you know, I think I might be having a problem. I'll just ignore that until I get back, you know, and then five days later, they end up being hospitalized for something rather than being able to talk through it as they talk with their doctor. So there's, there's a speed component to what we do as well that um, that's very, very beneficial to our patients. Excellent point. Yeah. That access. I love it. I love the access. And there are times when I, I remember, I had a pain in my foot and I texted, uh, WhatsApp is very popular. I sent a WhatsApp to my doctor and he said, okay, what you, he asked me a few questions and he said, okay, what you have is plantar fasciitis. And what I want you to do is get these pills, two a day for five days. If you feel anything like this, let me know. Otherwise, you know, you're going to have to do some stretching, go on Google, you know, look up stretching exercises and, and do those. And he was right. You know, no office visit. That was 10 minutes. It was real simple. I love it. It cost you almost nothing extra. No, it, it, there was, well, it's, it's just, forgive me, but it's a duh moment. You know, yeah. you, once you've experienced it, you will never go back. So if I'm the CEO, how do I know my people are getting great care? There's a lot of variability there. I mean, it's not consistent. And I'm looking for consistently good performance. Excellence is what I'm looking for. I was just thinking, you know, you have people that are going to clinics, just clinics, mm -hmm. whether they're seeing a doctor or a nurse practitioner or whatever, but they're not getting the continuity of care. They're not getting the attributes that you bring to the table. And if I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, I want all my employees to have that. And that's the point of the variability between the providers, mm -hmm. whether it's the clinic, the urgent care clinic, they don't see anyone until, you know, they need to go to the emergency room. Uh, that's what I was thinking. So, well, and uh, that's what I was getting at is to say that the continuity of care, um, whether it's a provider who is the best provider in the country or a provider who is not the best provider in the country, the continuity of care makes that um, it, it, it's such a huge deal that even someone who is marginal at what they do, um, is providing better care just because they're familiar with the patients and the patients are familiar with them and they know what to expect both ways. And so, 
if someone's options are, I just need to go to whatever urgent care happens to be open right now, and I'm going to get whoever happens to be working in that urgent care right now, or ER or clinic or whatever, um, if their option is to have a direct primary care physician, or even a direct primary care nurse practitioner who hopefully is working directly with a physician and, and, and has some, um, some direct access to, to bounce ideas off of their the physician they're collaborating with, then at least they get that continuity of care and they get the same person over and over and over again who knows them very well and, and they know very well. Um, and so, I mean, there is always going to be variability in, in the care that people receive, but when the variability is only that, this is the person that I have access to, at least if I have access to that person all the time, then it's going to be way better than someone who doesn't know them at all. Right, right. I it's it's all a part of getting primary care right, which is I think is critical, and especially in this year. Um, you did mention a little bit about the specialist and and when you when you recommend a specialist. Um, there's catastrophic care too. If I'm if I have an employee that's going to you know gets in an accident, God forbid, goes to the hospital, you're part of that scenario too, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, what, I mean, what is your question there? I guess that's the, well, there's a, there's a lot to unpack. And you're, you're going to be part of that scenario, meaning the employees in the hospital, and yes, they're being treated by a hospitalist, but you're their doctor. You can provide a lot of added support, if you will, including telling those hospitalists, look, my patient doesn't like news presented this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The human factor, the human touch, the bringing yep. the humanity. And I, I bring it up because I know there are hospitals that have Sherpas, medical Sherpas. And I thought, wait a minute, that's what my, uh, that's what my doctor does for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I go to the hospital, Javier is getting a phone call and he's going to go to the hospital and, and he may not be able to direct things, but he's going to say, okay, this is what is going on, and he's someone that I trust. Mm -hmm. I have a relationship with him. I don't know who these doctors are. They may be great people. Great, fine. But if I'm your patient, I'm thrilled that you're standing at my bedside going, hi, here's what's going to happen. <laughs> That's exactly, that, exactly right. So I will say that some, some direct primary care doctors actually do admit their patients to the hospitals themselves and, and um, mm -hmm. and round on their patients and, and do that. That's kind of, it's kind of a rare thing now, I think, in direct primary care. Um, I'm sure some of the comments on this, uh, once this is uploaded, will, uh, you know, whatever, there'll be some of my buddies attacking me on that statement. But uh, anyway, I think it's a rare thing now that direct primary care doctors are actually admitting to the hospital, which is true for all primary care physicians now. It's just, it's become a more rare thing. And so hospitalists are, are doing most of the care in the hospitals. Uh, the difference in direct primary care is that we do social rounds, uh, at least in my practice, all of my patients who get admitted to the, to the hospital. The hospitalists are the, are the guys, you know, actually putting in all the orders and, and kind of making some of the decisions or all the decisions. But, um, but I do social rounds on those patients at least once a day, usually twice a day, um, where I can go in and I can talk to the hospitalists because I maintain relationships with those guys. Um, and, and we, you know, go over the plan of care so that I can then walk into the room and, and reassure the patient and, and say, hey, listen, I think what they're doing is great and, and trying to give a layman's explanation as to what it was. And, and hey, you know, Dr. Smith came in your room this morning and explained what was going on. Tell me what you heard him say. And then wow. they'll tell me and it'll be 60% correct or 80% correct or 20% correct, whatever it is. And so then I get to, you know, sit and unpack it with them. And, and again, giving them that peace of mind and knowing that they're actually being taken care of in the right way and, and hopefully having someone in the room that they trust. And, you know, ultimately it's kind of like having a doctor in the family. Um, you know, someone who has a family member who's a physician, uh, they get that same care. The difference is my patients all get exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So last CEO type question. Um, and you had a small, you have a small business that you mentioned that's, that's signing up this week. And I have several that are already enrolled. Enrolled. So you have experience and you can help me integrate Elite DPC into my benefit plan for my employees. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not flying blind. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's an important point. Absolutely. Um, In fact, so that, that company is small enough that they're not required uh, to provide, um, you know, a fully funded, you know, prepaid health insurance package uh, or health. I don't even know what to call it because it's not insurance. It's something else. It's, it's a big prepaid health plan. Mm -hmm. Um, They're not required to provide that. And so we can show them how they can give, you know, essentially total wraparound coverage um, without having Mm -hmm. um, to pay for everything up front. And so they get, you know, catastrophic plan and then a DPC membership with it. Um, Another option is larger companies that have more than 50 employees who are obligated to provide health insurance for their, uh, for their employees and and HCA compliant type insurances. Um, It used to be that very, very large companies were the only ones that were able to afford self-funding of insurance. And so they all have fully funded plans, which are the expensive plans that we all know of, know about now. And when you couple a self-funded plan or what they call also level funded plans, which are somewhere in between. So there's, you know, fully funded plan where you pay a premium to the insurance company, the insurance company um, guarantees payment for everything that might happen with your, with your employees. Uh, a self-funded plan is where, you know, you accept most of that risk yourself as the company, um, but have a stop gap with an insurance company. Mm-hmm. Level funded plan is where you sort of pick a level in between those two um, of risk. And that's, you know, something for really small companies to look at, uh, especially with younger, healthier employees. Um, but with either of those level funded plans or self-funded plans, when you couple those with a direct primary care membership and that doctor is, um, is uh, involved enough that he develops relationships with your employees quickly and they, you know, can develop some level of trust to know that that is the person that they want to call when they have problems then it mitigates a lot of the nickel and dime sort of risk that can go along with those plans. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and those plans can be a lot cheaper upfront, which is typically the truth. But at the end of the year, there's, um, there's a risk sharing portion of those and the insurance companies or brokers can explain those to the, to, to CEOs, but um, that, you know, if they end up having really low claims uh, throughout the year, because the DPC doctor has been taking care of everything, then they can also get a lot of that money back at the end of the year, which becomes a savings. And then because of the low claims, the premiums go down year over year, which is the opposite of what they typically do with fully funded plans. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we can absolutely walk people through that. Uh, we have brokers that we work with directly for both mm. individual plans and group plans. Mm. Uh, we have big brokers that are working with, you know, large companies and, and, um, um, and, and, you know, fully, you know, full benefits packages and things. And, and, and they're all kind of slowly, but surely coming on board and starting to understand uh, how we can do this the right way and help companies and, and help, you know, employees um, experience a better way to do healthcare. Sure. Sure. We have, I'm in the midst of doing the healthcare buyer's guide for 2020, which is basically for the election mm-hmm. and trying to give people the attributes of great care so they know what to look for. They open up a proposed plan and they say, hmm, okay, where's this? And you've done a really great job of adding to that, uh, in my opinion, of what care really is, because that's something that you don't see a lot of in some of the plans. And so what are some of the things that you think people ought to be looking for in any proposal, regardless of party? Because this isn't this this really shouldn't be partisan. It should be healthcare is for everyone. So, what are the things that you would be looking for? If a candidate came on board with talking about um, uh, things like direct care and and being able to to you know um, have affordable solutions for s- separating out catastrophic problems in healthcare versus, you know, everyday sort of issues that can be planned for, um, then I would be excited to hear about those plans. Any politician that starts talking about transparency in healthcare and transparency in pricing, um, I would be excited to hear about because that's, that's a large uh, portion of what creates all of the confusion uh, in healthcare and, and, and where the cost is in healthcare today. Um, 
um, you know, expanding the use of, of HSAs and HSA plans, um, expanding HSA um, accounts to something like, why is it that I have to have a specific type of insurance plan to be able to have an HSA? Right. Why can't I just go and purchase an HSA account on my own um, and then use that for whatever, you know, whatever in, is included in healthcare or, or health management or, or wellness care or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, I should be able to use that for those things. I mean, that's what my understanding of what HSAs were intended for in the first place. Yeah. Um, you know, those are some of the ideas that I probably would get excited about hearing about, but um, you know, I that agree. is by no means, that's by no means a comprehensive list of the things that I might be excited about hearing about. I, that, that's I, such a big question. Yeah. Oh, it is. But I think it's, it's the attributes so that people are more well-informed and say, okay, here's, here's one thing. Privacy is probably my biggest, um, that's one of my biggest concerns and, and privacy. And you'll, I think you'll appreciate the, the phrase that I use, privacy is medicine's Jesus nut. And Jesus nut is an <laughs> aviation term. Yeah, for helicopters, I'm familiar. Yeah, and, and, and direct primary care protects it. Wait, you gotta, you gotta tell everybody what the Jesus nut is now. Well, I found out about it about 3,000 feet over the Panama Canal when a <laughs> friend of mine was a pilot with a quirky sense of humor. I just had breakfast with him last week. He says, hey Hunter, you know what a Jesus nut is? No. <laughs> he said, well, it's the nut that holds the rotor on to the shaft. So if the, if the nut fails, you meet Jesus on the way down <laughs> because there's no more rotor. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Captain Al. I really appreciate that. And I, yeah. and I laughed because I understand, you know, he's, he's also a mechanic. So I know he checked the Jesus nut. And engi <laughs> engineers. the loss of altitude that kills you. It's the landing. Yeah. Oof. That impact is pretty, uh, yeah, it's, he, um, so it's, it's engineers use it as a term as a single point of failure. And, and I think without privacy, medicine has got some real big issues as a whole. Yeah. And I would, I, I use that same phrase and I say, um, primary care is, is healthcare's Jesus nut. And without getting primary care right and protecting it, what do you have? We have yeah. big problems. It's interesting that you mentioned that about privacy. I just want to, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but um, one of the things that we talk about, so I have, a, I have several physicians that have talked about uh, becoming members here and wanting me to be their primary care doctor because, um, you know, especially in a small town like we have, um, all of the hospitals are on the same EMR and so any hospital worker who wants to go and log in and go look at Dr. Smith's medical record and why Dr. Smith was admitted to the hospital, you know, three days ago or whatever, or why Dr. Smith went and saw his primary care doctor last week can do that. And, you know, they may or may not get caught for it, but the point is that that privacy is, it's um, minimal at best. Uh, and, for us, you know, my EMR is separate from what they from what they're using in the hospital system here. Uh, it's essentially just electronic paper, and I'm not submitting anything to insurance companies, and so not even an insurance company is receiving any information about why I'm seeing a patient in a given day or a given week or you know what me medications we're prescribing and why, um, because it's no, all operating out outside of that system. There's no one else in the exam room. Nope, it's just us. And not Big Brother either. That's right. I had Twyla Braze on um, a while ago, and we talked about her book, Big Brother in the Exam Room, and privacy and how HIPAA is not privacy. All that is a roadmap for 2 million entities to start looking at your data. Right. Um, I'm going to switch I'm going to switch gears real quick because I mentioned something aviation related, and I watched some of your YouTube videos, and I noticed it took 26 years for you to finally get behind <laughs> a stick and fly. <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, what, what held you back for 26 years? Oh man. So, okay. So you mentioned I watched Top Gun. And so obviously, you know, flying is something that was super exciting to me. And uh, in fact, when I joined the Navy, they asked me what job I wanted. And I, I didn't really know at the time. I just wanted to go do something positive and I and wanted to do what my dad had done. And 
And so I said, uh, you know, I like scuba and I like flying. And they said, well, what about being an air crewman? And I said, sure, that sounds great. I had no idea what it meant. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I ended up uh, as an air crewman in the Navy. But prior to joining the Navy, I actually went through aviation. I went through pi private pilot ground school, hmm. did all the book work and everything, took the test. But I couldn't afford to get any flight time then. And so I got I didn't get any hours, just went through ground school. Then I joined the Navy and was an air crewman. And, uh, and I flew on a plane that a, bit, a P3 Orion, but I was a, I was a radar operator on, on a P3. And um, uh, let's just say that riding in the back of the tube of a plane, you know, in a, in, you know, the way it's described now, a tactical environment, hunting submarines, at, you know, just a few hundred feet off the, off the surface or, um, you know, anyway, all the things that we did on those planes um, and, and throwing up into Walmart bags that are hung around your ears while you're trying to do your job and whatever. It doesn't lend itself to being excited about flying anymore. That doesn't and, uh, the movies I, either. <laughs> no, yeah. They didn't show that part in Top Gun at all. Uh, and so um, I kind of developed, a, I, I guess the right way to say it is just a little fear of, of like stalls and spins and falling and that kind of stuff. And I knew that I was going to have to go through that in training. And so mm. I just kept kicking the can down the road saying, I'll do that next year. I'll do that next year. But I always had this internal desire to get my pilot's license. And uh, anyway, on my 44th birthday, I said, it's time for that to stop and uh, time to face that fear. And so I registered as, as a, registered as a student pilot uh, on my birthday. And, um, and now I have a grand total of six and a half hours. <laughs> That's working more than towards I have. my pilot's license. What's that? <laughs> it's more than I have. I yeah. have zero. Well, actually, I have 15 minutes. Without any ground school, I was able to fly. My wife manages an air charter company. So every now and then I get to go up and oh, I have cool. not done helicopters. Um, yeah. That, there's something. I'll leave that to people who know helicopters. <laughs> just something about that. So you faced your fears and moved yeah. on. And... You know, that's something that I, I can connect the dot here. There are a lot of people who have fears about health care, mm -hmm. their health. And it seems to me it's logical that having someone like you, I mean, I have it here, but having someone like you in, in their corner and, and helping them work through it. And all of a sudden, you know, they've, they, I think you put it, uh, wait a minute, where are my notes? Um, you had a great line. The other side of our fears. And that you, you mentioned that moving, getting to the other side of our fears. And I thought that was a great line. Yeah. So you're able to help patients move to the other side of their fears and say, ah, well, actually that isn't so bad. And your, your own experience with flying kind of demonstrates that. So I commend you on, on taking the stick and, and doing it. Yeah, it, uh, it still makes me nervous. But um, <laughs> to equate that to, uh, I haven't completely gotten over the hatred of having to do <laughs> stalls and spins in my training. But uh, anyway, we'll get past it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll get uh, more okay with it as time goes on. But um, yeah, the, to equate that to what we're doing with DPC is is to say that I'm going to let go of this thing that I think is is security, when, which is really not. I mean, anyone who's gone through um, the denials process of an insurance company saying, hey, we're not going to cover that, or anyone who's gone through, you know, trying to see their doctor and not being able to get in to see them for six or eight weeks or whatever, or, or even if it's just six days and I'm sick right now and want to see somebody, um, you know, it's not really the security that everyone thinks it is, but, but for a lot of people, it's just scary to think that I'm going to walk away from what we've been doing for the last 60 or 70 years and, and possibly drastically change that. And, and so for that reason, we don't have contracts in my clinic. Uh, I don't sign anyone to a contract. It's month to month from day one. Um, and sometimes people come in and they do $3,000 worth of stuff on day one. And then they, you know, they're ready to leave and, and, you know, they'll come back, Hey buddy, I'll be back in six months when, I need refills. And, you know, we, we work through that for those few individuals that want to do that. But, um, but the reason I don't sign people to contracts is just to say, Hey, try me for a month or two months or six months or whatever. And as soon as you decide that this was a bad idea, you are more than welcome to walk away and there'll be no hurt feelings. Um, you know, because I know that in six months or a year, you're going to come back realizing, you know, maybe that wasn't that bad.
no, I, and and ha just having the access. There are a lot of young people, I think, that, you know, they don't think they really need the care, and and they, they couldn't be more wrong, in my opinion. That doesn't mean to say they need to be overzealous about things, but there's a lot more to care now, stress, environment, um, you know, what kinds of things, and, and Direct primary care really fills that role nicely, and especially for the, you know, the younger the younger crowd, they have instantitis. <laughs> I want it done now. I have an app for that. Well, you know, that's why I say there's slow medicine, but there's also fast response when you need it. Yeah, that's right. And you you covered that very well, and I think the something that you said very early on about that that small business saving 60%. Granted, not every business is going to save 60%, but that's a big chunk. I haven't even heard of that big of a chunk of change being saved. That That's a real eye opener. I mean, ears going, pardon me? <laughs> what? <Yep. laughs> so, uh, Dr. Creighton Shute of Elite DPC, thanks for your time and your service and for joining me today on the show. Honor, thank you so much for having me. This is fun. Anytime you want to do it again, we'll talk about anything you want to talk about. Well, great. And thank you to all our viewers out there. Please share your thoughts below and subscribe too, if you don't mind. We appreciate your support. So we'll see you next week. And there you are.